Hello and welcome. I'm Julia Manchester, political reporter at The Hill, and thank you for joining us for the Sustainability Imperative, our two-day virtual festival taking a look at how we can keep our planet healthy. We will examine what leaders in the public and private sectors are doing and should do more of to set a new pet energy paradigm. We will ask what responsible environmental stewardship practice looks like in practice, and we will also explore what individuals like you and me can do to lower our own mark on the planet. But before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Environmental Defense Fund, for its support of this program. We will also be bringing you multiple sessions of programming today and tomorrow. You can watch them all or tune into specific segments. Go to our website, thehill.com slash events for all of the details. But before we get underway, I have a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at The Hill Events using the hashtag The Hill Sustainability. We are broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page. That should be a quick fix. And for our first conversation, my colleague Sharon Udison spoke with Dr. Christoph Gebald, founder and director of Climeworks. They've recently opened the world's largest direct carbon capture and storage plant. Take a listen to their conversation as they discuss this innovative technology and much more. Hi, Dr. Gebald. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, to get us started, I think that many people watching this actually have no idea what you do, what Climeworks does, what carbon capture really is. Could you give us a very quick uh, summary as to what carbon capture is? Yeah, hey, first of all, nice uh, being with you today. Well, first of all, carbon capture is not the same as carbon removal, right? So carbon capture is capturing CO2 from a smokestack or a concentrated flue, for example, a coal-fired power plant. Uh, or a cement factory, um, and this, this is referred to as carbon capture, and that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is carbon removal. So what is carbon removal? We're building machines that suck in air, atmospheric air, and separate the CO2 contained in this air from the airstream. And this CO2 we capture out of the air, we are providing for permanent underground storage. And that's what we do. So we, we filter CO2 from the atmosphere and pump it in the ground where it will stay forever. That's carbon removal. I think for those people who are a bit aware uh, about both carbon capture and carbon remo removal, um, that some people kind of think that it might be the works of science fiction or that it's unproven, unrealistic. What do you think about that? Is this a realistic solution for the planet? Um, and also, I was looking at um, a, I, I was reading a University of California, San Diego study from late 2020 that showed that more than 80% of 39 projects that have sought um, to commercialize both carbon capture and storage have actually failed. So I'm, I'm wondering what makes Climeworks different? Well, cl clearly carbon capture or, or carbon removal is, is a reality today. Like we launched our first commercial operation exactly five years ago. That was in May, uh, 2017. And when we commissioned a plant in Switzerland, um, actually sourcing the atmosphere, for, uh, uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere and providing the CO2 to the Coca-Cola company for beverage carbonation, as well as to a greenhouse. Those were uh, early market applications we have been seeing. <clears throat> Since then, we have uh, further worked on the market. And um, just September last year, we commissioned an additional plant in Iceland uh, that we are referring to as ORCA, uh, which is the world's largest um, um, direct air capture and storage plant, uh, permanently removing CO2 from the air. So clearly, um, direct air capture or carbon removal has left laboratory stage, and it's clearly not science fiction. So it's 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 indeed uh, reality. But on the other hand, we 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 have to stay grounded, and there's clearly a long journey ahead of us. Right, several orders of magnitude we have to scale. Uh, but the point I want to make, it, it's happening uh, out there and you can touch and feel it um, uh, with installed assets out there. I noticed you could actually really touch and feel it. I was watching a video recently about, about Orca and you see uh, the carbon actually underground sticks to the basalt in, in Iceland. And there was a, 
a picture in one of your videos showing that you could actually really tangibly see the result um, afterwards with this technology. Um, yeah, yes, indeed, that's that's a nice part. So this is this is the part of our partners, Icelandic partners, Curbfix, that is um, a company that is specialized in permanent underground storage of CO2. And they, over the last 20 years, they've been developing a process for permanently storing CO2 in the underground. And as you laid out exactly, so what they do, what Curbfix does is they pump CO2 in porous underground rock. And in this rock, the CO2 essentially is turned into stone on the surface. So it mineralizes on the surface. And in such, it's, it's really tangible. Like you could, like we have drilling cores of the CO2 storage site where you could see the pristine rock um, as well as um, white or grayish parts, uh, which is essentially the, the mineralized CO2. So you literally can witness uh, how CO2 from the atmosphere is turned into stone. So if this is in fact um, technologically feasible, we still have the problem of scalability um, and who's going to pay for this on a global scale. I know that you guys uh, individually have uh, raised hundreds of millions of dollars to scale, scale your technology, but um, aside from Climeworks or in addition to Climeworks uh, as a whole, how can we make this type of technology globally scalable? Is it governments that need to pay for it, private sector? At the moment, uh, as you described, at the moment, it's 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 private sector. So at, at the moment, or the largest share of it, at, at, at the moment, um, we, we have um, essentially private as well as institutional investors uh, investing equity in Climeworks. Um, we've raised a bit more than $800 million as of April 2022. So we just closed a $600 million, $650 million uh, or 600 million Swiss francs uh, funding round with one of the, or with the, the among the most renowned uh, technology and infrastructure investors globally, like uh, Partners Group or GIC, Bailey Gifford um, uh, um, among them. Now, so that's on, on, on the equity financing side. On, on the market side, we are currently also having a lot of push uh, from, from the private sector. Like we do have uh, carbon removal um, customers like a Microsoft, Stripe, Shopify, Audi, um, The Economist, uh, or people like, like Bill Gates or, or uh, the stars Coldplay are, are using the service. But clearly the private sector won't bring us to megaton or even gigaton scale. And that is what climate science asks us to do, right? We have to achieve gigaton carbon removal in the next 30 years. And to get there, we exactly need policy. Like we need the public domain. And I'm I'm very, very happy to, to see, especially in your part of the world, in North America, uh, very strong momentum. So we're very thankful for momentum from the Department of Energy uh, in, in, in the United States. Or also recently we uh, heard about developments in Canada, which uh, very explicitly look into direct air capture and carbon removal and support that um, with very wealthy uh, uh, tools, um, which clearly will stimulate this whole industry. Another potential issue that um, people discuss is the energy required um, to accomplish all of this. Uh, what is the balance um, between the benefits of removing carbon from the atmosphere and the cost like for the energy required is it is it possible to accomplish this all with re renewables or like what what are you guys thinking about that well it's always i always feel it's the simple way to put things in a negative light and you could also put it in a more inspiring or in, in, in a positive way and the way i see it and actually that's where i'm originally coming from study thermodynamics and, and energy science and especially renewable energy as is where like my legacy education is from. And the way I see it um, is that direct air capture can be a very strong catalyst for the renewable space. Uh, very concretely, um, renewables are not on, always available when we need energy, right? So the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining uh, when we wanna turn on our dishwashers, right? So essentially what we have to do, we have to overdimension our renewable energy system in order to meet our baseload demand. Now, what happens if, if we uh, overdimension a renewable system, we might have a lot of curtailment in times when we can't use that energy, right? And exactly for that, 
climate technologies like hydrogen production uh, or um, uh, direct air capture can be very efficient energy sinks, right? And that might sound a bit counterintuitive at first glance. However, I, I do have the impression that direct air capture can be a very powerful tool to strongly expand the growth of renewables because it, it can accept energy at times when no one else needs this energy, right? So it can be a tool to enhance grid stability. And consequently, I'm <clears throat> like every two or three minutes more primary energy hits the planet than humanity is using every year in the form of primary energy. So it's not that we are resource limited, right? There's more than enough energy to, to do all those needs. Uh, the, the question is how we can resource it. And the beauty about air capture is that we can put our machines wherever on the planet, right? Like we're sourcing the air from CO2 and we essentially can go there where there's a lot of renewables. So in short, yes, I'm convinced that, that we can combine air capture with renewables. Okay, so a good um, note to end on would be, um, let's say Climeworks and all the other companies um, who are having success with these technologies um, do continue to succeed and we do continue to scale um, with the appropriate investments. Um, do you have any concerns that the growth of this technology would hurt the globe's ability to reduce emissions? Like would perhaps um, governments and companies feel that they can just fall back on this technology and no longer um, have a desire to try to, to reduce their emissions? No, I don't have concerns for two very practical reasons. First is cost. Like we are, we are the last resort, right? We are there to remove what cannot remove otherwise. Um, so I'm always saying, or I'm always questioning also when, when serving partners, um, are we serving their unavoidable need, right? If you used what we are doing for emissions that are avoidable otherwise, right? Um, we're way too expensive. Like, for example, if, if say you had a cement plant and you're um, not striving to reduce emissions or, or use carbon capture at the stack, but did everything with carbon removal, it might be a very expensive solution for, uh, for the final product, right? So it's simply too expensive uh, to, to do it all, right? And the second thing is growth. Um, According to climate science, we have to go to 10 gigatons um, by 2050 roundabout uh, of carbon removal annually, which will be probably half nature-based solutions and the other half technology-based solutions. Um, and achieving this growth is very ambitious. It, it's doable, but it's ambitious, right? So we essentially have to replicate what solar and wind did in 40 years or so, maybe condensed down in, in 30 years, it's doable, right? But again, I'm repeating myself, ambitious. Now, if, if we made out of 10 gigatons, suddenly 50 gigatons, because we were not reducing CO2 elsewhere, I'm not so confident that humanity, or at least there are no data points in, in, in the history of scaling tech that we have shown this growth. And I'm, I'm always confident when I see data points in history that this has been done and solar and, and wind have shown the growth rates um, for what we need according to the IPCC. But again, if that was five times the amount, uh, I, I don't have any data points uh, that, that confirm that and that may concern me a bit and, and think we, we cannot achieve it from, from a growth perspective. So again, very simply, cost stands in the way of, of this, we call it moral hazard and, and the scaling potential. So basically all of these solutions would need to occur in tandem to really achieve what the world at large is looking for, I think. Yeah, exactly. There's no silver bullet. We need them all. We need a portfolio working together. And that's exactly the art uh, to, to have like this carbon reduction, carbon removal efforts uh, coming together to tackle those 50 gigatons that are currently being emitted. Okay, great. Uh, we thank you for your time today and appreciate your uh, insight. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Very nice meeting you. And thanks again to Dr. Christophe Gibald and Sharon Udesen.